You're listening to Three, the podcast. Hello and welcome to Three, a podcast where three filmmakers get together to discuss movies. Join us as we dive in to figure out how these movies work and what they can teach us about the art of filmmaking. Whether you are a filmmaker yourself or you just love to nerd out on the art of cinema, we invite you to take this journey with us. This is a film discussion by filmmakers. Today we're discussing the movie A Monster Calls, directed by J.A. Bayona and written by Patrick Ness and starring Lewis McDougall, Sigourney Weaver, Felicity Jones. Please be sure that you watch the movie before listening any further because this is sure to be full of spoilers. So let's get into it on three. I'm reading this book right now on cinematography by Chris Malkiewicz called Film Lighting. It's a weird format. He got a ton of like gaffers and and cinematographers on movies to just give their insight on it, like how they work with it. I was reading one who was talking about how before shooting is scheduled on day exteriors um, scenes in movies, he'll go to the location early in the morning before daybreak and stay there till midnight to study how the light will change. And I read that. I was like, whoa, that's intense. That seems very intense. Like he did this Uh, once or he does this consistently. he, He like does this like that's, he he said he takes pic- he takes pictures every two to three hours from the same angle, yeah. Just base and he takes pictures on like the same film stock that they're using. It obviously super in depth, but dude, it's 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 shit like that that makes me feel like wow, I am not a DP. It's like the the level of like yeah. intensity that some people bring to this craft is yeah next level. Well, it's like planning. It's like perfect planning and being ready for everything, right? Because once you get on these huge budgets, there's so much more on the line and you're pretty much like your your margin for error is so little that you have to be prepared for that. And it kind of stuck out to me because I also was just reading in a recent American Cinematographer magazine, the DP of um, from Midsommar was talking about how pretty much the whole movie is shot in a big field. He said that for testing, they pretty much went there for a day. I think it was a whole day or maybe a couple days with like a whole crew, cameras, everything, and some stand-ins like wearing the the same costumes that they were going to wear in the film. They, they got shots 360 around talent to see how the light is every 20 minutes all day from sunup to sunup, da- sundown. So they could take those shots wow. and be like, and plan the whole movie around them and be like, okay, this is what we can expect for how the light reacts with the backgrounds and the talent and everything throughout the whole day shooting in that field. I guess, I guess when your whole film is riding on a field, you got to really know that stuff. And especially for that movie, it's like a horror film in daylight. I haven't seen it. Did you watch it? Um, I I think I saw part of it on a plane and then actually oh, couldn't finish oh, it. Oh, no. I need to go back <laughs> and watch it. <laughs> I saw it's part a, of it on a plane. That's a sentence that... <laughs> like a, dra- a director, a director's worst nightmare. They give years of their life and someone's like, <laughs> ah, yeah, I saw part of it on a plane. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. My bad. No, but I was just... I landed, so I had to get off the plane. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Anyways, it just kind of gave me some insight onto into like that big budget movie making world and like when you read that does it, does it inspire you does it get you like what is the reaction that it has for you do you feel like inadequate like oh i gotta get my shit together and go harder or do you do you just like reading it like what's the effect on you i think what i've been learning about being a director of photography the past couple of years is the bigger you go on budgets, a lot of times it's just more about how you handle responsibility and how you lead crews and how you plan. And those are kind of the skills that start to come in more so than if you can set up a shot and light. And I mean, obviously that stuff's all got to be there. You got to know how to do it. But I think the planning and the responsibility is huge. Um, I was just listening to a live stream with Matty Libatique and his crew on from Birds of Prey today, which he kind of confirmed a lot of this too because he was saying like when you take jobs like this and he was talking specifically about birds of prey so a huge dc movie in that superhero genre he's like you when you take jobs like this 
they come with a do not fuck up card. <laughs> like that's what he said. And, and they were pretty much a lot of the stuff they were talking about and they were showing like lighting diagrams and all this stuff from pre-production that it, you just, it, it's so, it just hits me that it's so much about communication too and leadership, like a DP on that stuff just needs to make sure everyone's communicating with each other because if art department doesn't know that this light's going to go there, you know, you show up to the day of shooting and, and there's so much conflict and that can set you back. And, and when there's millions and millions of dollars involved, you don't, you can't do that. There's, there's not room for that error. It's something I've been learning. So it's, it's more interesting to me. Right. It's, I've been trying to grow those skills in myself the past couple of years as I've got gotten to DP some bigger like jobs. Communica so. Like communication, you mean? Yeah, communication and just being responsible for um, more. I guess communication to all the different departments that are under you. So camera, lighting, and even art. And, and I don't know, like the first few bigger budgeted TV spots I got, it was a huge learning curve for me. But I would say a lot of that stuff is what I learned. I think when you, when you start working at higher levels, there's like a, a much, much larger expectation and learning curve for whatever craft you're in it's crazy the, just the amount of work and professionalism that goes into it like I, I my first job was as like a script supervisor mm -hmm. and absolutely insane the level that you kind of have to play it and the movie that i was working on was like the the main unit had four cameras right. minimum at all times so like it's it's just crazy when you start playing at the higher levels i just got off a tv show but the the expectation in and the professionalism of communicating with your department and knowing exactly what's going on and how it plugs into the rest of the show it's nuts man so yeah, for sure it's just been a big learning curve and something i've been just diving in and being like okay it's not all about knowing your composition and lighting and colors and all that it's also like are you a good leader and i think at first caleb just going back to what you were asking i think it was eye-opening and maybe a little bit of a bummer to hear and find out, but I've embraced it a little more. Yeah, it takes the craft away from being a cool trade or an aesthetic trade to something very, very different. For sure. And I think when you're when you're starting out, you work on these projects where you just show up with a camera and you do get lucky. You're just you just kind of point the camera around and say, Okay, this is where we're this is the coolest spot. Okay, set up one light and you're good. And then you shoot for twenty minutes and you're gone. But you know, <laughs> Once there's millions of dollars and you're in time involved, you're just, it's a whole nother level. And it's just crazy. It's crazy to learn. No, I think it's interesting. I haven't been learning anything to do with cinematography for a while now, just because I'm stuck inside and I haven't been taking any classes or anything like that, but I've been writing a lot more and just been falling in love with cue cards and just roaming around with cue cards with me at all times. Like, you know, you know what cue cards are like for studying those little no card recipe card whatever you call them and uh been really enjoying just having those on me and then when a random idea hits me i can just like run for a feature i'm trying to write and just jot the idea down so like last night i was at a i was distance i was socially distanced at a family member's house and then we we're having a fire in the middle of the fire i had an idea and just ran not ran but like walked over got my bag and wrote the notes down it's kind of this feeling of uh, idea creation being a bit more uh, fluid, a bit more like through the day, not, okay, when I sit down, I have this much time to come up with ideas. I've been liking this idea of cue cards where I can just wait for ideas just to come into my mind. Even if they're not developed fully, they're just kind of random. I can just write them down, get them out of my head. So I've been really enjoying that part of coming up with ideas. Are you like a more of a kinesthetic type of guy? I think that's what you call it, where it's like hands-on. Like, is there a reason why you use note cards and a pen versus just whipping out your phone and writing it down i think i think the reason would be more just it's nice to just sort through them and, and be able to lay them out yeah and put them on the ground and like re reflow them jason's pulling his cards out right now the, yeah the chat but there's something about cue cards where it feels lower stakes because you can throw yeah. one out you can you don't have to delete it that's what i've been learning more about being less anxious about coming up with ideas and coming up with like the ending or what's going to happen and being like okay Having times where I sit down and write and then having times where I just mob around with these cards. If something comes, it comes. And then I also learned about Quibi. <laughs> you told me. Oh, yeah, Quibi. <laughs> you guys mentioned Quibi and I'd never even heard of it. I saw ads. I didn't understand what it was like on YouTube. And I what think is it? that's it. It's, well, I'm so not. It's basically 
series shows 10 minutes or less with a list quick bites quick bites with like a list celebrities i don't really give a shit like i don't have much opinion on like streaming and oh like the industry's changing i was more fascinated by just you can watch it horizontal or like portrait and the way that they framed their shows it works both ways it was pretty That's interesting weird. I would love to like know what is going into it because you can just be watching it horizontal, like full widescreen. And then when you flip it vertical, they have just the right framing in their compositions yeah, I know, that I, work. I know they do a lot of keyframe tracking and stuff so that they, they can kind of keep the frame, especially oh, for like portrait really? mode and stuff. Yeah. But I'm guessing, I'm guessing these shows that are specifically made for Quibi probably have guides of what's going to be in there so that that, that keyframe tracking isn't necessarily like it, that that it has to be in there all the time. I don't know. It's it's really interesting platform. I wonder how the industry is going to move forward with it. But I mean it makes a little bit of sense because uh, listen, I grew up after YouTube, but all the people that are coming through film school these days that I was teaching on, they all none of them like sit and binge TV shows. They're usually sitting and binging YouTube as they go to bed. They like sit on their phone and watch endless like short bits of information. And so when Quibi was coming out, like I didn't even know how widespread it was until I started talking a lot more to uh, kind of a younger crowd. But man, it's crazy. People grew up with that kind of just culture of short clips of, of things. People are making their entire income on YouTube videos. So I, I think that it could it could blow up if it kind of, you know, takes and keeps. But it's a, it's a weird hybrid. We'll it's, a, it's a very strange hybrid of because uh, YouTube is basically anyone can throw their stuff on it. So it's like TikTok, you know, all those, but this is yeah. Netflix meets vine. It's very, very strange. Yeah. And to me, my immediate thought was, oh, I love the challenge of writing seven minute episodes of a show. That'd be so fun. I think just to think completely differently. I do not think you'll ever get the same emotional experience you'll get from sitting for two hours in a movie, but right. I still think it'd be a fun challenge. And I'm curious to yeah. see if it lands as a part of people's day-to-day -day routines. These seven-minute shows. To me, as long as it's good art, good stories, and it's good quality, like it's just well-made. I mean, it, then that means it's just more work for us, more work out there for people who want to be in the film industry. Um, what scares me is when I I'm on YouTube and I see a YouTube ad for like a major company and it just looks like garbage it looks like someone took their iphone and recorded it at their house like th that's when i that's the kind of stuff that makes me nervous but like, like when you yeah, think that that the attention to detail is getting it's a, yeah like right, companies like, are companies are figuring out that you know what us hiring out expending 200 grand a day on an ad is yeah. not worth the return exactly. is that what would scare you is that what you mean yeah for sure and it's not like it's something i see like a flood of or, or all of a sudden it's just every once in a while I'll, I'll catch an ad on youtube that i'm just like ooh, they paid probably <laughs> the lowest dollar for this and it was shot on an iphone at 60 frames per second and just thrown up and and you wonder that, if it's gonna work just fine yeah i don't know I, i'm not super pessimistic about the industry i think there'll always be work there'll always be something to there'll always be stories to tell but well, I, I feel like we're not even the people that can be pessimistic we haven't i haven't played in the game of the system prior to this very much so yeah if quibi is the future it's probably gonna be the industry that we rise into you know right. when, when when tarantino talks about whatever people aren't going to the cinema anymore it's like well that mm -hmm. ship had already sailed before i was even interested in filmmaking really so right yeah and i, I mean this, I, this coronavirus might be the last nail in the coffin for that <laughs> for, for, <laughs> for movie theaters weird. yeah i know it's so weird yeah it's a natural progression though it's gonna it's gonna kind of die down a little bit and then it's gonna morph into something new yeah and then, it might be you know, that's something better how even like cinema has always been how everything is like man. theaters have always had to adapt because tv is always quick on the heels of movies and so now that netflix and hulu have such a big space and amazon prime and all that kind of stuff i think movie theaters are going to have to adapt i don't i don't know what the next step is but you know like basically provide a different type of experience yeah maybe it'll be like more privately owned theaters like there won't be as many theaters but they'll be around like privately owned and maybe they'll show better content yeah. like they'll show new stuff but maybe they'll be able to show some older stuff or even like tv shows like when game of thrones was going strong i thought 
when season eight was coming out, how sick would it be if you could go watch each, in ep- the episodes each week in a theater? Because like that type of show would fit so well in it. I mean, so cinematic and such an epic story. But we still people still read books. <laughs> so I mean, right. like if people want if people want to intake stuff in a certain way, the humans always find a way to keep stuff yeah. going. We still go to yeah. art galleries and look mm-hmm. at paintings when we have photos. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I think if if people make it a priority. I ain't going nowhere. For sure. Jason, what about you? What have you been learning? Um, I've just been learning uh, just keep creating. Like, I think that that's what I'm learning. Um, I'm pushing forward on writing a new movie. And kind of like Caleb, I went back to the old school way of doing things, putting tape on the floor um, because the walls were too nice to put the tape on. So (laughs) I had to put put the tape on the floor and then like put note cards out. You know, basically start storyboarding this new movie and got pretty far on it. But anyways, I've just been realizing, like, I think it's just being reiterated, at least in my life, is if you want to do something like creative, you just have to you have to go for it. You have to push for it and not accept anything less, you know. And so I think I'm trying that in this season in a new place, you know. Um, And so it doesn't matter the circumstances. You just got to kind of keep grinding, you know. One of the things that's always been like a challenging phrase to me is don't just talk about it, do it. And for so long, I talked about making movies when I was uh, when I was a kid. I used to talk about making movies that I that I loved. Like I grew up and I loved. I went to go see Jurassic Park like sixteen times in the theater because uh, dinosaurs when I was a kid was like you know my favorite thing. Um, and then I started kind of going to watch movies and kind of getting more into the independent film scene. And I was just like, I'm, I'm done talking about movies. Like I want to, I want to make them. I want to be like right in the middle of that. So, um, but the only way to do it is to just kind of dive in head first and you might be met with a very painful crash or, (laughs) and learn from that. Or, um, you know, you kind of get stuck into the middle of it. So I, I think that's kind of one of the things that's being reiterate, reiterated for me, especially now having just moved countries from Australia where I have, where I've had a production company and uh, built quite a lot to here where I'm, I'm kind of starting fresh in the business. Um, but nothing's really changed as far as like, you just got to kind of go for it no matter what. So very awesome. Cool. That's what I'm learning. Yeah. Yeah. That's inspiring. I remember when you, uh, when you were starting making your first feature, you saying something like that to me, um, you were saying, we don't want to talk about making movies. We want to make movies and just do it. And mm-hmm. that's kind of stuck with me. Like, I think a lot of this industry is you wake up every day and you, and you just think, how, how can I make this happen? How can I make this happen? And you just keep pushing and not yeah. giving up. And the ones who do make it, they, they never stop asking that you know they don't give up and yeah they're successful and now you can talk about movies and make movies oh because we're doing a podcast yeah. so right. talking about it's totally cool it's all right here <laughs> on three the podcast <laughs> <laughs> we got our commercial for the week there we go <laughs> okay i think it's a good set that was a pretty good segue jason not gonna lie a segue into what is this week's movie this week we are watching a monster calls and um Monster Calls was directed by J.A. Bayona, written by Patrick Ness, and starring Lewis McDougal, Sigourney Weaver, and Felicity Jones. All right, so the storyline is, the monster does not come walking often. This time it comes to Connor, and it asks for the one thing Connor cannot bring himself to do, tell the truth. This is a very touching story about a boy who feels very damaged, guilty, and mostly angry. He struggles at school with bullies, and pity looks from everyone. And at home, his mother's sickness. Will Connor overcome his problems? Will everything be okay? Will Connor be able to speak the truth? So Jason, Jason, where did this movie come from? Why did you pick this movie? I've never even heard of it, seen a trailer, nothing until you mentioned it. It's from what, 2016? Like where, where, where is 2016? Yeah. So I had never heard of it either. So last week I was doing a little bit of research because um, the last two movies that we've watched, like The Square and Mother. I was like, it'd be cool to do something in, in a very different direction, you know? And so I was thinking about doing like looking at kids movies because I love, 
I love when, when, you know, Stranger Things is such a huge TV show, but it was like so nostalgic because it, it reminds us of our youth and reminds us of when we were kids and playing around. Um, I love Super 8. I love, like, I love any movies that are involving kids and, and usually because what they're doing is they're, they're, they're simple morality tales. And um, so I, I went looking for like a kid's movie that we could watch and I started seeing like all these people talking about this kid's movie that wasn't really a kid's movie, um, but it was really powerful. And so I'm not a huge animated type of person, but I knew that part of this movie involved animation. So um, I checked it out, saw the trailer, and I was like, all right, this is the one we're going to go with. So I chose A Monster Calls. And plus, I love the director. Um, well, I love one of the movies that the director has directed. Who is the director uh, the again? Impossible. Oh the yeah, the impossible. J. A. Bayona. What's the impossible? The impossible is uh, that movie where uh, a tidal wave or a tsunami hits Thailand. I think it is. But the thing I love about the impossible was he put us right in the middle of this family when the tsunami hit, and there's this scene where Naomi Watts is getting like tumbled like a washing machine like, like like someone who's stuck in a washing machine by the tsunami and i realized when i watched it in theaters i was holding my breath trying to hold my breath not even realizing it as long as she was underwater anyway so i've always been a fan of the impossible and what he was able to accomplish with that whole tsunami scene and so i was i when i saw that he did like a kids movie i was super interested so that's kind of where i I thought we should go. This is what my idea was a lighthearted kids movie. Yeah, I know. You said that and I was watching it like, <laughs> yeah, this is not what this is. Is this a kids Same. movie? Oops. Is, is this or is this? Um, no, I think that it's a, well, it's, I mean, people are calling it a kids movie, but it's really a movie to the kid in every one of us because I think that it's probably a more universal message, you know? So, but before I, I go that's on, that's what makes it unique. Yeah, maybe you, you guys give your thoughts of what, what you guys thought about it. I don't know what I thought about this movie. I think I have two hats when I'm ingesting or watching a movie. There's the normal way I watch a movie is I'm always watching movies, hunting for the types of things that I want to make and be inspired by. A movie like this is definitely not that. There's no part of me that wants to make a movie like this. It just seems like the scope of it is way beyond anything I'd ever want to try and pull off. And then I'm just not interested in, you know, animation or that, that hybrid between animation and real life just doesn't, just doesn't grab me. But I think watching the movie, I was really surprised with its portrayal of grief and the fear of losing family members and something that I, the older I get, the more and more I process that I'm going to lose people. And it is a very, very scary thing that I don't even want to think about. I don't even want to face. So I think whether I want to make movies like this. I did see a bit of myself in the character, even though it wasn't my style of a movie. So I'll give it one out of four. I'm just joking. One out of five. So I'll give it 0.5 out of five. No, I I think if we're going to do into this discussion. I think it's around a two out of five for me, this movie. Cool. This movie, it took me off guard. I'm not, I mean, yeah, because you, you guys said it, or Jason, you said it was a children's movie. So, but also the first like 45 minutes, I wasn't into it. And, and I thought I would hate it. But then it took this turn that I, I wasn't expecting. And all of a sudden I was really hooked into it and like tearing up in the end. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and one of the things I, I kept thinking was like, is this a children's movie? And then I, I think this is a movie I would show my kids. Like, obviously, depending on what age they would be. Um, I don't have kids now, but I, I was reading this book uh, on Danish parenting recently. <laughs> as one does because, as you do <laughs> because they're the happiest kids on earth so yeah why not no uh, but this book pretty much just studies danish parenting and how they how they parent um one of the things they brought up was that they share stories with their kids that encompass all emotions they don't just focus mm. on sharing with them fairy tales that happily ever after they try to tell share stories with them that might have sad endings or deal with fear or anger or grief which it just made me question it and mm. and kind of call back that book and be like yeah I, I think i could call this a children's movie still you know yeah um, if you redefine what children should be watching mm -hmm. based on this book yeah that's interesting right like i really i really like that it's a cool point yeah and you can kind of see 
for Danish kids, they are better off for it. I mean, I think they grow up and and they kind of know what to expect with some of these emotions that are a little bit harder to deal with. And, and I think they, they turn into adults who aren't as like scared or shell-shocked when the first time they have to deal with grief or sadness or responsibility, mm-hmm. you know? So it's a cool idea. So anyways, that kind of made me like it too a little more. Um, I would say I'm sitting around like a 3.5 strong out of five stars nice yes so my first impression was actually that i didn't like it (laughs) i thought it was a little dry at the very beginning i have a love-hate relationship with british cinema and (laughs) even though i know jay bayon is like um spanish i think he does a lot with kind of british cinema so anyways so i started watching it and I think the turn for me kind of came maybe a quarter of the way through the movie, uh, 20 or 25 minutes in or something where I started to care about this character. I think like I chose the movie wanting to do like a light quote unquote, a lighthearted kids movie. And then I started watching this and going like, okay, these little fairy tale things that the, the tree are, are telling this kid are, are not like what I thought they would be. And I was totally. like, somehow they have to tie together. Like, I just thought that how he was telling the story to this kid, I thought it was going to be so on the nose, you know, like this is what you do with grief. But really he was talking to, um, he was talking to the kid. And I think that what was really well done was that these stories really all had to do with things that we deal with in our every day, what to do, with things that we don't understand? What do we do with circumstances that we can't control? What do we do with feeling like we're nothing or we're invisible? But it was done in such a way that it made you sit back and question, as you're questioning the story and what the hell the story is supposed to mean because that tree should be like telling this kid what to do. Instead, you're learning yourself because you're asking the question. So that's where I got impressed, I think, with the story storytelling or the screenwriting at least of this movie is because it had me asking questions about my own self and my own life as the movie went along and I feel like the 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 storyline did not go well the main storyline went how I expected it you think that this kid is obviously dealing with the 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 fact that his mother is going to die and you know big spoiler alert she dies in the end. So as far as that storyline, you know what's happening, right? But this kid with his um, the tree and the um, and his imaginary friend who's the tree, uh, who's like kind of telling him these stories and then saying that you have a story that you're going to tell me in the end. I just thought how they did that was so clever. And um, so I'd probably put this at a four out of five for me. I, I I think I really enjoyed it a lot more than I thought I would. And I thought that because it was a kid's movie, I thought it was going to be really on the nose. But it, I don't think it was, you know. So was in, in lots of ways, it was that. really on the nose. But yeah, those stories definitely weren't. I think that was what keeps, yeah. kept me in it. Because the way it was, yeah. the way of like telling child's experience through an imaginary friend or a character that they draw and like even like oh once upon a time i'm gonna tell you a story that kind of relationship feels extremely it's been done so much oh yeah like and that's why going into it i was like oh my gosh like i've i've seen so many movies like this oh he's bullied oh this guy shows up at certain times i just it was really hard for me to to give a shit just because it just felt like such a classic movie. Even the way the music was, the way it looked was so YouTube cinematic movie look. And every, I don't know everything about it. But then, yeah, when it really got into the stories, I remember watching and being like, what do these stories mean? Which was very smart of them to make the stories a bit more ambiguous. Yeah, for me, I, I was trying to under like figure out why it, the first like 30 or 45 minutes, I, I wasn't into it. Maybe that's why it was kind of like, felt very predictable and like you knew where it was going and then when it started to take that turn and and not hold back and just going to that dark side or the darker side of like human emotions and reality yeah it was more definitely more intriguing and and kept me hooked i I feel like this movie couldn't have been made in hollywood Uh, unpack that a little bit yeah well i think 
some of the reasons I was saying, like, I think in Hollywood, if you're going to make a movie like this, it has to be full on kids movie. And it has to go that route that I thought it was going for the first 45 minutes, um, like the predictable and happy ending. You know, uh, I think maybe it could have been made in America as like an indie film, but obviously then the tree situation would have been differently or different. And what's interesting is I feel like this movie was this director's transition into Hollywood, which is kind of cool because he went on to do Jurassic World after this. Um, and, and something I liked about it was that it didn't follow that s- same children's structure of happily ever after it. But I just don't think Hollywood would have accepted that from a marketing standpoint. It would have been like, hey, this, this there's a kid in this, a tree, like this needs to be a children's movie, like a Pixar film. So, and not that they're not doing it right, like they're doing it in their own way, but... Do you think, though, because don't you think that that stories are kind of opening up and being a little bit more honest, like like Inside Out, which would have, I guess, is is that Pixar? What is it? Or no, DreamWorks. Yeah. No, it's Pixar. Is it Pixar? Yeah. I don't know. I think that there's like the emotional landscape in the, the kind of world of children is, is starting to open up a little bit more. But yeah, I do. I, I also kind of understand what you're saying. Like, I, I don't know if this could have maybe in the in, independent space. Could have been made in the States, but definitely seems like something more of a European sentiment. Yeah. Right. I think that's why Pixar is so successful, too, in what they do, because it's not like they're not doing what this movie does. Because, I mean, a movie like Up, which is pretty old now, the opening sequence to that, it's that's so true. sad. It's like one of the saddest sequences mm-hmm. ever, where they kind of goes through the, the married couple's lives. Um, but they still deliver in a way that kids just eat up, you know, and it's very, like, attention-grabbing. Yeah. And I just think they're doing it in their own way, which is awesome. This movie just felt like something that doesn't fit. And maybe, you're right, Jason, maybe now, it's it's been a few years, maybe even now there's, like, more of a market for it. But uh, I was a part of a kid's movie back in the day that was funded by the Hollywood. And it was really sad because, like, I knew the director personally, and you know the director was actually trying to accomplish something with the movie and i think it was moving in like a really cool direction it was of course a little bit of a darker tone and a little bit more serious tone but in the end like he pretty much got locked out of the editing room and it just became this like kind of teen pop movie and when i saw it i was like i was on set every day that's not really the the movie that we filmed (laughs) Um, it was a lot deeper, had, had, had a lot more themes that, that I think that would have been palatable by kids, but here's the deal. I think that maybe for so long, we have not really delved into the idea that kids emotions are, are actually quite complex and they can understand things, you know, we don't always give them credit for. Um, and the crazy part about this, this kid, um, what's his name? Connor O'Malley. Connor O'Malley. Uh, can you do like a really good Liam Neeson? No, that's okay, that okay, like plot. That. Okay, plot side note. In the photos in his room was Liam Neeson, and the the tree was voiced by Liam Neeson. No way! I didn't actually notice that. Yeah, at all. and that, and then the drawing had the little girl on the shoulder of the giant. I think he lost his dad also. What? No, Connor O'Malley's dad was in the film. Oh no, 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 no! His dad was in the movie. When? His dad was the one that came from L.A. His dad was from the states. Yeah. I don't even remember and, that part. <laughs> Why is there all these photos of Heath or not Heath Ledger? Fuck. Uh, Heath Ledger. Dude, who are we talking about? Liam Neeson? <laughs> Where am I right now? Uh, okay. Why is Liam Neeson in how the photo? How much of that craft beer have you had so far? <laughs> he can get through the square, but he can't get through this. But why is Liam Neeson in the photos? Is he? I didn't notice that. Look at okay, go to the scene. I didn't notice go to the it. scene where his uh-huh. he goes into his new room, his grandma opens the door. There's photos of him with Liam Neeson, like all over the place. It comes throughout the whole movie. There's random photos on the walls, and they have Liam Neeson in it and Heath Ledger. <laughs> <laughs> and then the Joker comes in. Oh man, the Joker came in. That was okay. So this is on a different level right now. <laughs> yeah. Wait. So there. His. I'll have to look at it. I don't think. I don't think Liam Neeson was in there, other than Dude, the he, voice of. He one hundred percent is in the photos. Let's check it out. Okay, let's just check it out. We can um, always cut this. Pull it up. Let me say this first. So Connor, um, what was his last name in the movie? Connor O'Malley. O'Malley. Listen here, Connor O'Malley. That's, That's actually pretty <clears> good. <throat> My voice isn't low at all. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> but played by Lewis McDougal. So this kid actually lost his mom oh. to multiple sclerosis two Shit. years before. So this kid is like 
had actually kind of gone through probably in a more realistic age um, in his own personal life. I, like, I think he played the character so well, like that perfect mix of angry and sad and withdrawn, you know? So art as therapy part two. Yeah. <laughs> what do you do with a movie like this? Do you, do you guys view this as a very, very good movie or is it, like, is it just you kind of think, oh, that movie wasn't for me, and you put it on the shelf? It's just weird when, I, like, I either, you, I'm used to either hating movies or loving movies, defending them or talking shit on them, and then a movie like this comes along, and you, I just kind of leave going, huh, that, like, was good, it was important, but I just don't give, a, I just don't, I don't know, I don't know what to do with it. Well, there's probably a bit of, like, emotional trauma in your life that you're not ready. <laughs> oh. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. So Liam Neeson is my <laughs> oh, Liam Neeson is my real dad. <laughs> so what you're saying is no, I don't I, I don't really know because I think that this definitely is, is something that people will agree like with this. Obviously, grief mm-hmm. is an association thing. People who've been through grief might relate to it or the storyline. I love tragedies as as far as storytelling vehicles. Um, and I think for my own life, I've dealt and faced grief and and family members dying that I didn't know what to do with those emotions that I had because you feel I think th- that's the important thing you feel so much you don't know how to feel like there's all sorts of layers of like you feel so much you don't know how to act you don't know how to feel the world for you stops but everybody else keeps going and you do feel isolated but th- the truth is you're not isolated. There's usually other people going through that with you. So, but as far as like this movie for a general public, I don't think that you have to think that it's important. I don't think you have to think that it's the best thing ever. It could be one of those things. that's like, I'm glad I watched that and move on. You know, I don't think this is something that I'm going to go back and watch a bunch of times. Like, I thought of like three people I wanted to send the movie to. Right. You know, like, which is interesting. Did you, I'm curious, did either of you guys have that thought? No, I'm always really like nervous with especially the subject matter of, of cancer. People watching it who have been through that and if the depiction is accurate or not accurate, I just don't want to be held responsible in any way for like thinking that's my view of it. Although, yeah. Let's figure out if Liam Neeson's is in this movie. We'll get back to this whole grief thing later. <laughs> I think grief I think it was it was well done. When I'm watching a movie and then we're gonna talk about it, I want it to be loud in some way. And this movie is hard to talk about because it just kind of okay what i didn't like about this movie i think are movies like this is i don't know where the director fits into it personally and maybe that's just a part of like where i'm at but i I can't see a stamp of a director on this movie beyond like just executing a story did you guys get that feeling when you watch this movie well maybe explain that a little bit more like when i watch noah bombach i can clearly feel his way of writing and his view of life in the movie and this movie, it could have been directed by like 50 different people. I didn't see the director coming through in the story at all. Maybe because I don't know anything about the director or his previous work. Are you saying that the, you don't think that there's a strong viewpoint? Maybe or a strong tone or a strong anything from the director. Like I think that the subject matter was super personal, but the way it was done didn't feel personal to me. Maybe because of the maybe because of the way they the way they went about. Yeah, it. I think some of these bigger movies, and I'm not saying that this is the case in this one, but they're made that in in that way where like a studio picks it up and is like, you know, no directors attached. Whereas I don't know much about Noah Baumbach, but he se- is he someone who is gonna write and direct or kind of pick his own movies and oh, get, you guys to get w- him off the ground. Have you guys ever watched any of Noah Baumbach? I might, I may have, but. My point is, I think that I mean this could have, like he, could have sorry, been directed yeah, yeah, by yeah. I tons think, of different directors, like is, but yeah, it's, um, is Liam Neeson in a No Bombach film? Yeah, Liam Neeson is No Bombach. <laughs> no, I just think I'm not drawn to movies where it's you can tell somebody thought this up, you know, got people together, they wrote it, they poured themselves into it, then they executed. That way of filmmaking is what attracts me to filmmaking. This yeah. way of filmmaking where it was like a rendition of like a, a storybook and then someone just made it and executed it. Like be, story aside, I'm trying to, the same way with Mother, I'm trying to unpack why I just thought it was okay. Uh, yeah, I don't think this this is one of those films where it's about the director having a strong worldview. 
what's what is interesting i think that if you look at his like list of movies a lot of them are told from the children's perspective so it's like how a kill kid feels about that situation but and i think that there's probably a place for that you know like one of the things like i i don't know if you guys have kind of if you've been into Mr. Rogers or any yeah, I was, of the I was thinking about that earlier in the conversation. Yeah. Not many people are making serious films with the depth of emotional understanding for children on this level. Cause right. I think that he is making a kid's movie. His other movies do talk about like the storyline of from the perspective of children and maybe there's nothing to relate it to, honestly, because I don't think anyone really makes movies in this genre of like basically a kid's movie that an adult can understand. I don't, there's not much like it, but I do sort of agree with you. There's not a strong slant or a strong viewpoint. Well, e- um, like even even Where the Wild Things Are. Do you guys remember that movie? I don't even remember if it was good or not. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That, there's mm-hmm. lots of feelings that this had a similar vibe to that movie. This movie was probably better thematically, like what it was getting into, but it was also, it was a children's book made into a movie, but stylistically there was yeah. so much of Spike Jones in that movie that I think there was mm-hmm. like a, a tone that was, he brought a different tone to children's movies, but this has kind of had the feeling of that because I'm never ending story it had a, a feeling of lots of movies. Um, there's just, okay. There's two things I'm interested, not interested to talk about, but that my experience of this movie was, is like the the conversation of Liam Neeson. <laughs> is Lee, what is he in it? Go to the scene. Go to the scene. There's two things I care about: okay. Liam, Neeson. Liam Neeson and Heath Ledger. <laughs> okay, there's movies where it's like talking about grief and talking about filmmaking for children and how filmmakers should approach teaching and shaping children. That's probably the more important conversation. And the things I was saying before are more me trying to figure out why I thought it was mediocre. I think I, I am interested in. Like I think you talk about Mr. Rogers. I think he was a person that approached, he talked to children about death and things, and that was what made him such a big deal. Have you guys seen the new Mr. Rogers movie? Yeah. The movie was so well done. Oh, yeah. Dude, I, it really was. That was like a movie that if I felt like a kid. Where, whereas, this one, I, whereas this one, it was like I had to, I had no choice but to feel what the character was going through because it was so loud. Like, it's like obviously so sad. And yeah. so I had to feel it. Are you finding the Liam yeah. Neeson photo? I think you might be right. Dude, there is Liam Neeson is in the photos. Jason is going to check. No, oh my god, yeah. <laughs> Liam Neeson is her father. Oh. Oh, okay. Okay, so it's her as a little girl. And that's why being held by Liam so that's why she looked up and she could see the monster. Like you know when he's in the room of the hospital yes. thing? That's the connection with the mom. Wow. And the monster, because yeah. she lost her father as a child. Good, good eye, man. I, oh, this, totally, oh, this I, turns. I had to rewind it. This turns now. Hey, I'm a big dumb bull, big dummy, <laughs> and then all of a sudden, good <laughs> eye, man. Good eye. Yeah, but yeah, you guys didn't believe in me. Ten, that you thought yeah, you guys, no, you guys O'Malley's were haters. <laughs> no, no, but you guys weren't believing. I just in thought me. you were drunk. You guys weren't <laughs> believing in me. You say, oh yeah. He's on some <laughs> other plane. Yeah, and you can't listen to this guy. I never look at you. Good eye, he says. <laughs> Liam Neeson. Just accept. Liam Neeson. The, just is... accept the compliment. <laughs> there, by the way, there's only one photo of Liam Neeson, so just. It was an Easter egg. Looking for more. Good catch, though. Yeah, like, what do you guys want to talk about with this movie? Is there anything more to say? What it's talking about is we can have that discussion, but I don't have like a. When I when you guys started this movie and you were bored. It was probably a similar experience that I had. You're kind of like, you thought I was going to be predictable, right? That's kind of all my beef was with yeah. it. Just like the way, I don't know, the way that you used, like the bully is there. And then, right. and then he's going to yeah. stand up to the bully and the camera drops down like three feet and he gets bigger in the frame, revealing the clock that says 1207. Like that kind of shit is like, it's just picture perfect execution of the things that you would read in a book. Mm-hmm. And when I, I, and when I see, your style. I know that's, that's fine. Yeah. Was it your guys' style? Could I have made this movie or been had like a lot of fun making this movie? I I think so. But I I also associate it with it on a level of the grief that I've experienced in my life and and not knowing what to do with it. So I I did experience it on an emotional level 
it, it definitely hit me between the eyes, especially at the end. Um, and somehow this director, or at least the story, maybe not the director, because I, I think that there is an element of what you're saying, is, which is true, but at least the writer struck an emotional chord on a depth that I've never heard anyone talk about before uh in the area of grief when, when you when you say you love the when you say you love the writing what did you love about it just the okay well okay let's maybe go to the climax when the it's the fourth story and the, the monster comes and says that connor o'malley you have to tell me your truth and he's like i don't want to and he, the, the whole scene where the the graveyard falls apart and a big hole opens up in the earth and he's trying to save his mom there was like a perfect opportunity for everything to be super surface level because it's all visual. It's all shown there. But I think the writing was actually very measured the, the way that they wrote those scenes. And, and I think that it, again, with the stories not going like the three stories that the tree told. So, um, but I just feel like the moments were there uh, there was a lot of subtlety in the storytelling between Connor and his grandmother. Uh, Connor and his mom, that was a predictable story. Although I love Felicity Jones. I I, I love her performance too. Um, and her driving home the fact that all she wanted was more time with her son, you know. But I thought that the, the writing was just really clever and it wasn't too on the nose for what you'd expect for a kid's movie. So specifically, I think the the scene in the graveyard was really, really strong where the tree is talking to him about, I'm not here to save your mom, I'm here to save you. Um, and then another, there was moments when his when Sigourney Weaver, the grandmother, picks him up at the graveyard and is rushing to the hospital and they get stopped right there um, because there's like a train crossing or something. And there's like this exchange that happens where he's apologizing for destroying her living room and destroying her family's favorite clock. But she says that doesn't matter. And you and I are very different people, but we're going to have to learn how to like we share. She was like, we share your mom. We bo- like that's yeah what we but uh, the, the way the what she explained i think i was like wow i can't believe that they went in that direction i thought it was i thought it was really good like you said i think the story was basic for a reason and predictable for a reason like that that, it, that it's meant to be that it's supposed to build an expectation in one direction but what i love about the movie is it took you in a completely different direction on how to deal with your grief or how to deal with your anger rather than saving the mom character. Again, I do think that there is a style thing at play here. And it's all right if it wasn't your style, if you're just not that emotionally in touch, you know? No. I'm just, I'm totally no, messing with like, you. I don't, I don't take it. I don't take the bait. I just think that, like, there's tons of kids' movies that, you know, animation's not my style. But, like, I gave Inside Out's a five out of five. Like it's a it's a it's an amazing movie. And there's tons of kids movies that aren't my style, that are a, amazing movies. I think I think it's important for movies to teach emotional intelligence, and this movie did that. So so Will, you were about to you had some notes, some questions, some things that I think could push this conversation forward. What kind of things did you what kind of? No, I guess I just in my notes I kind of had some things like like some quotes that I really liked. The monster uh, towards the beginning tells Connor O'Malley stories are wild creatures when you let them loose who knows what havoc they may wreak I love that that was a cool that was and cool. and I felt like the stories he told Connor those two animated ones felt like parables in a way like very like they were stories with messages like he, he, that were just like kind of confusing and you had to chew on so even like some of my questions uh like the story with the parson like what I I still I couldn't fully even grasp what that was saying which yeah. one sorry the story with the parson and the um, apothecary because mm-hmm. he was willing the parson in the end was willing to give up everything to save his daughters but that was a bad thing and i and i was like i i don't know what it's saying here like did i miss something i felt that when i was watching it too yeah yeah i know that was kind of the point of the stories was to kind of make you really think and chew on them and and try to figure out what they mean but I didn't know why, because then they went on this big thing where Connor thought one of them was bad. He's like, why didn't you destroy the apothecary? The the apothecary, yeah. 
And then he like threw out another good quote about belief, which he said, belief is half of all healing, belief in the cure, belief in the future that awaits. Your belief is valuable, so you must be careful where you put it and in whom. I was just trying to kind of grasp that story and the theme of the movie. I couldn't really figure it out. I think what I took away from that is the there are situations that you can't control. Like the enemy wasn't the apothecary or the parson. The enemy was the plague that was happening on the land. Whereas who gets punished because the parson preached against the apothecary and the apothecary lost everything. And meanwhile, the apothecary gets begged to help the parson's daughters, even though he's completely ruined his career. Um, and sometimes you can get really distracted on who's the real enemy, but really the enemy was the plague. The plague was what was killing people in the land. And so I think that maybe they're using it as something where the monster talked about like situations that are out of our control. And the, the main thing that you want to do is kind of fight with each other for your rights of what you feel should or shouldn't happen. And unfortunately, in those situations, the plague is the enemy and the plague doesn't care about your rights or what or what you think. And so I think that there was a, a deeper message that at least the monster was trying to teach Connor was talking about like like in, in this case, your his mom had had cancer and you can fight with your grandmother, you can you can fight with your dad, you can be angry at everything, but the real enemy is the cancer. So it's kind of like I think it it was looking at the the situation and learning how to fight against the situation with an emotional awareness um and to tell his mom his final truth which was um I don't want to let you go but it's okay you know yeah, like right and i i just i think that that was pretty cool i think it was pretty great how they kind of told that story i think i like it the more that i talk about it yeah i'm willing to bump it up to a four stars just because i i really like how it went that route and it just it wasn't afraid to be like hey th- we're just gonna go right to this dark side of grief uh mm-hmm. in a child and just tell that story and using a monster to help him deal with that i felt like worked well for me just like a child's imagination you know and him being like someone who draws there was a moment the moment that i started to like the movie was his dad is visiting and that he has like a little monologue in the living room about their divorce he never uses the word divorce which i think is interesting i don't know he painted divorce in like the most positive light he could he he says something like most of us don't live happily ever after we live messily ever after that whole scene was kind of when it started to turn and i started to think wow like i'm i haven't seen these topics dealt like this in this way before so i think you're right i think that these the emotional side of things i, I appreciate that it was there like i appreciate that it was kind of telling it even from a kid's perspective because i think that these are type of stories that do need to be told or else we're just going to be raising a bunch of kids that don't have a depth of emotional intelligence or how to deal with those things when they do come into play exactly, in yeah. their lives. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? I wish there was a little bit more of that when I was growing up Same. as far as preparation for some of the things that I faced in my own life, you know, and, and how to deal with it. So I, I thought it was, I thought it was interesting. So what about takeaways from this film is what are some things you guys will take away in your own craft? Uh, I would probably say one of the first takeaways that I would put in is never just throw out Caleb's opinion uh, just because you think it's crazy that Liam Neeson was not in the movie. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> uh, so true. Big takeaway. So, so true. true. So true. <laughs> hey, I got That's him. Good point. I got him in the conversation. That's a good point. No, um, I think takeaways for me, I don't mind the big budget feel of things i'm relieved that the story went deeper than than where i thought it was going to go um and i think that the the performances and the chemistry between like lewis mcdougall and felicity jones and even with sigourney weaver and i i love the performances as a director i think i would find a way it did kind of feel like maybe j.a bayona was it was his first time doing like huge cgi stuff or something it kind of felt like he was a little bit overwhelmed and just doing it from like a classical style so 
I don't know. I think my takeaways are don't be afraid to broach. I like big emotional topics in films. So, but finding a way of doing those in, in, in a unique fashion, because even though you're dealing with such heavy content, I think that there's a way to tell it with a unique voice rather than just coming like straight through the front door and being so on the nose with this is how you deal with grief. You know, I like how this movie made you think. So it's a, it's challenging me as a creator and as a writer to write appreciating my audience's emotional intelligence or at least trying to inform it. I think the thing that really hits me is I would be very, very afraid to take on a topic like this. I think there's lots of bravery that comes along with like, let's take on grief and death and let's make it more terrifying and let's make this a kids movie so i think it was very very bold i think I, i'm kind of scared of big emotions in movies because they can go south i think I, I find safety in maybe things that are a bit more niche or trivial or funny or i don't know a bit more less huge <laughs> like you know like this movie was a massive topic of grief and then mother last week was taking on whatever all of humanity and art i would be scared as a director to take that stuff on and i wonder if that would hold me back me, it's more of a conviction that like sincerity and taking on topics that can be deemed as cliche is okay to do sometimes if you can do it right. I don't have much takeaways beyond that. So I think the problem with me lately is that I have a hard time taking off my filmmaker hat. Like even you t- pulling quotes out of a movie, like, oh, that line was good. That line was good. I can like, never do that. I always kind of <laughs> go in. And, I never do that anymore. No, I don't like... I don't watch movies like I read books where I underline things. And that's something that may, maybe my takeaway is how you underlined lines from the movie. I thought that was really cool. This movie had a few. I mean, I just, every once in a while, somebody would say something that would really resonate inside me. And I don't know why, maybe in the moment, but I'll just quickly jot it down on a note and move on. But yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. I, I feel like since we started this podcast, I kind of have to, I have to watch movies with my filmmaker hat more. And it's, I kind of enjoy when when I when I don't have to think about stuff there's like a beauty in it because it kind of brings me back to the magic of just like letting the story affect me as I watch it I'm not thinking about anything else but the downsides of that is I end up liking movies (laughs) any movie (laughs) I'm just like oh I felt something oh okay it has a positive ending five stars on letterboxd (laughs) and then like (laughs) I think about it a little more like I put on my filmmaker hat after I'm like wait no, there were some serious flaws with what I just watched, but it's interesting that that's a thing, like the filmmaker hat versus just, like you said, watching a movie, like you read a book where you're just like letting it affect you and trying not to think about it as an art or craft. Yeah, I, I'm going to go back to, I think that it's good to be informed in all styles. Like this yeah. is this is something like I I have my filmmaker hat on watching this movie and I think I got a lot out of it. Um and plus what he does in the the arena with kids like it might make a little bit more sense if you watch The Impossible. Um but I think that it technically this movie is good. It's just not slanting hard at any one angle. And I think that, that yeah. that's probably where William and I got our boredom at the top and you didn't necessarily see it, think that the director was saying much. Maybe it's because it was kind of front on and there wasn't too much of an angle. So that probably is a, a directing issue or a producing issue, depending on how that, that deal all, all worked. But I think that I think that there's a lot to say with these movies uh, as far as like performance and an emotional level of storytelling. Because it's actually very hard to tell these stories on paper. Try to write an emotional scene without it being completely cheesy or completely right. forgotten about or just over the top. To get the nuanced emotional skill that I thought I, I was watching, you know, that the conversations between the kid and his grandmother, the conversations between him and his mom, I thought that those were great nuanced scenes. And again, maybe attribute that to just the writer. <laughs> Because it was actually really well written. Yeah, good stuff. I don't really have much to take away. I, I think I really, I thought the monster design was really cool. And I, I maybe it was because I was watching it on my iPad, but uh, I thought the like the CGI was really good. It got better. It started out pretty rough. I think okay. that was kind of part of it. I found like the the first scenes with the monster were like felt very dated, and then it, uh, it almost settled into okay. it. It got better. As the movie went on. Do you guys feel that way? Yeah. Like by yeah. the time it was like coming into the school think, and stuff, it felt like it was actually in that space. And the other stuff was almost, maybe it was more of like 
at the beginning it was fully out of a storybook kind of there's like flames and stuff and then they kind of wanted to make it get more real as maybe I don't know and it did have a little bit of transformers vibes at the very right. beginning yeah. Whereas I thought that it was a lot more. It did remind me of Transformers, man. That's hilarious. It, yeah, like the beginning, I think that even yeah. like coming up to the eyes. Yeah, it is. It's Bumblebee mm-hmm. the way that he walked and all that kind of stuff. But you're right. When they were in the school, it was a lot more of an artistic choice down at the kids' level, and the tree was always bending down, bringing his face down low. Like I just thought that it got better and, and more creative at the beginning. It was just the CGI was at least the CGI storytelling with the tree was probably a little rough it seemed rough yeah yeah i just think once yeah once it got going and they stopped with those like flaming effects and once when the monster was just like face to face talking with connor it felt like he had a lot of emotion like you could a lot of that emotion came through his facial expressions i think they did good with that oh with the monster yeah like he like he genuinely seemed concerned and then Liam Neeson was bringing his thing too. So I, I liked that. I loved the watercolor animation stories. I thought that was beautiful, of course. Yeah. Wrap it up. Well, what's the next movie that we're going to? So the movie I'm picking is Cold War, directed by Powell Pawlikowski. <laughs> Jeepers. <laughs> One more time. One more time. The movie that I've picked for uh, the next week of three podcasts is Cold War by Powell Pawlikowski. (laughs) (laughs) One more time. (laughs) I'm just kidding. Thanks for joining us on Three, the podcast. Make sure you subscribe and join us next week for another film discussion hosted by Jason Solari, William Somero, and Caleb Ford.